Hello, 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 and welcome to this episode of the Getting Creative podcast with me, your host, Shakira Newton. Getting Creative is a podcast in collaboration with the National Youth Theatre, where I'll be chatting to folk from all creative industries, finding out where they got started, where they've been, where they're going, and getting some advice on how you can get started on that journey too. Today's guest has written, directed, designed, and produced multiple pieces of art from stage to screen, while simultaneously committing their time to helping up and coming creatives reach their potential and have successful careers of their own. A person who has been at the forefront of representation in the arts, advocating for queer and black and brown rights since the beginning of their career as young as 17, today's guest has, proved the, has paved the way for a great number of British creatives today. Please join me in welcoming the performing arts industry's very own love ninja, Ricky Beadle Blair. Hey. hey how you doing <laughs> very very well especially after hearing that thank you very much thank you, thank you. i do get a lot of um a lot of praise for my intros <laughs> <laughs> they're very good thank you um so like i said in the intro how we get started on this podcast is just finding out a bit about you um and your life growing up um i did read the guardian article that came out yesterday in which it said that when you were 15 you put on a production of bugsy malone after you saw it um mm -hmm. in which you played Tallulah, which i literally was gagged about because i need to see that i wish that it was like filmed well, my my one of my brothers, Gary, is an actor. Yeah. Um, and he really wants to, I think he says he wants his first piece of writing to be called My Name is Tallulah. <laughs> oh, <amazing. laughs> and he says he wants to do a film about what it was like for us growing up in Bermondsey and me putting on plays for, with all the local kids and stuff. So I mean, he's really passionate about doing that. He brings it up. Or, you know, on a regular basis. So maybe you will see, you know, s s um, some amazing emerging person playing <laughs> my 15 year old Tallulah playing self. Oh my gosh, Gary, if you're listening, please, please, please write that. I need to see it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but before, um, before you got bit with the Bugsy Malone bug, um, what was it that drew you to just theatre and performing arts in general? Yeah, I, well, my mum taught me to read. My mum, Monica, uh, came over when she was, uh, you know, just 12 years old from Jamaica with her mum. My um, mum died not that long after and she's, you know, had to be looked after by her sister. And, um, and then uh, she got pregnant with me at, you know, a young age, you know, my mum. So my mum's always saying, I'm now I'm not using my mum and sister because we're so close in age. And uh, and so she was this young girl growing up in South London, um, you know, just trying to make her way and at a crazy time and discovering her sexuality because she's a lesbian and she was trying to work all that out. And, uh, and she, I, I was the first, so I got a lot of time and she gave me the gift of reading. She taught me to read as soon as I could speak. It was something I just took to straight away and she encouraged um, wholeheartedly. And so by the time I was three going on four, I was really determined to be a writer. I loved reading and so I wanted to be a writer. And, um, and that was my party trick to stand up when people came to visit the house, you know, and she would say, what do you want to do? And I'd say, I want to be a writer. And then they'd all go, oh, what? Ah, nice, that is a little English, he's a little English boy, he's going to be a writer, you know. <laughs> and uh, and so that gave me a lot of encouragement. So I, then when I was about seven, my distant faint memory is that I saw something that had an audience participation element to it. Some kind of kids theatre, maybe, uh, maybe um, West Indian theatre, because you know West black people talk back to the stage but also so do British people in panto so I feel like I saw something it's very likely a panto that I saw or a Jamaican panto and then there was always speaking back and I thought oh the characters can kind of have an, an, an energy exchange with the audience obviously I'd thought about it slightly less articulately than that but that became my passion and then I realized oh people write these tv shows and they write these films so I can write these and so I started writing, that was about seven. And then about eight or nine, growing up in this council estate in Bermondsey, I used to, we always played fantasy games, superhero games, which I loved doing. I always wanted to be a superhero. So then I just, I kind of morphed those games into plays that I would write and my friends would act them out in the block on the stairwell. 
we call it the block, but it's the stairwell to the flats. And, um, and that's why I started writing my first plays and my friends just perform them with me. And when you're that young, it doesn't occur to you that it's a big deal to do that, you just do it. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I've continued to do, essentially make um, an expanding pool of friends that I write pieces for. So any, any project that I'm doing, is this kind of family atmosphere in which I get to know the people involved. We don't do impro or anything, but I do, I listen to them a lot, talk to them a lot, kind of sample their DNA. And I'm like a fashion designer, kind of looking at all my models thinking, they'd look cute as a Greek God, or they'd look amazing as, as, um, as, a, as an Ubuntu warrior. Or, and I just kind of dress them up as the characters in my head and I write the, the scripts for them. And then when we revive them, I try and keep it open so that a new actor can inhabit it just as much. But that's really what I've been doing since I was eight, seven, eight, nine. When I was 11, I got this amazing um, serendipity because I, I liked um, junior school and infant school a lot with a few painful moments, very painful moments, but kids have those. And then, and then I was in, invited by some local hippies who were in the greengrocers across the road in Bermondsey Street to come and in, come and help build an adventure playground on one of the you know Bermondsey was filled with bomb sites that was still there you know 30 years after the war and um and do you want to help build a, a adventure playground I said yes and then these hippies were saying they were starting a school and so me and my friends from the estate started going to this school above a post office on Bermondsey Street um where this in this teacher's flat and she would just teach us her own way and she was basically experimenting with a, a more free radical more customized to the individual version of education and so when she actually then made this an official school I might ask my mum if I could go and to my big surprise Monica said yes and so me and my brother and my and the next two down, there's five of us, but the next two down who were alive then were doing, were, um, we all started going to this free school in Bermondsey called Bermondsey Lamppost. And there I could do anything I wanted. I could turn up when I wanted, go home when I wanted, wear what I wanted, um, ask any question I wanted. And the teachers were never afraid to answer um, the most direct question. And, uh, and we create our own curriculum. So I did I, I, I love doing astronomy, I love doing Egyptology, and I love doing London history, because I lived in a historic part of London, and I love writing plays, making films, making music, and, and that's what I did. They got me a little camera, I made films, they would send me to the local cinema, I would do reviews, and I could just put on plays all the time, and that is what I did. And then my school folded, because it's completely unfunded, it was completely ad hoc, um, when I was 15. And um, so I kind of went out into the world quite early, and then just started building a career. And all the things I'd learned from Lois and all the people who ran, who ran the school and all the other amazing teachers like Rena and Fred, all these, you know, the first name people, right? Um, I started applying that to a play or a film. So I can make a, anything out of what's lying around because that's what we did. We didn't have money to put on these things. So now I'm on a film set and we can't get to a location. I can look around and go, okay, we can build the location here. We can film it this way. I can rewrite the script. And so that was the core of my, of my creativity, which of course, a big part of that is treating each person as an individual and trying to create work that, that spotlights that actor and, and uh, often uh, actors who cannot get a, a foothold in our industry because they are considered not the standard leading man or leading lady, or indeed are being pigeonholed into that and they feel they are more than that, come to me all the time and say can I work with you and I try and create vehicles for all these incredible actors and it's been literally hundreds and hundreds of thousands of actors now through my career that's what I've been doing it's a sorry big speech but I tried yeah. to bring speed with the whole core of it all I, I a big speech but I was just here like a nodding dog the whole time like yeah tell me more tell me more it's just... and all my siblings are in the business too because they started out you know Gary is this amazing actor incredible he was amazing at seven he's amazing now and he was a, he became a child actor and you know he's done EastEnders and absolutely fabulous and 
um, he's doing a, a big um, something in the Star Wars universe now. He just never stops working. He's worked at the National, at the Royal Court, at the, uh, the Hampstead. I mean, everywhere, everywhere there's a theatre, he's worked there. And, um, and, and the others are all following suit. Carleen is a producer. My youngest sister, Naya, is playing the second lead in this big movie right now, just leaving drama school, like you. She's just coming out of, because she's our baby, she's just leaving um, Guildhall now. And, um, and uh, Nathan is a, um, is a personal trainer, because fitness is a big part of my life. I teach an exercise class every Sunday morning. And he, um, he, he is now joined the firm and he's writing these amazing scripts. So it's a showbiz family. Christmas at your house must be amazing. <laughs> <It's> loud. <Yeah. laughs> no like one gets a word in it, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, let's talk about your fitness, your Sunday fitness. Yep. Um, I well, you know, resting jobs. Um, I had a, I had a job called An- dog called Angelica many years back, who my company is named after. And Angelica, one day I was doing my starving artist thing, struggling and enjoying myself. And you know, you know, you're young, so you don't care. You know, I, I'll find food, I'll find rent, I'll somehow do it. That's how I was. And um, then one day Angelica was looking at me, where's the food? <laughs> and I was like, ah, uh, my baby needs food. I can't do it this way anymore. So I went down to the local sports center, which, cause I went there all the time to exercise and swim and and I said do you need anyone to work here I got a job as a receptionist right. and then they I, they asked me to cover um because they knew I was a dancer could you cover this exercise class she hasn't turned up I went in and busked it and everyone was like that was amazing so I so they put me on this course and I learned to be a fitness instructor <laughs> and I oh, okay people are like my classes I'll have like 10 15 people I would have 100 people turn up at my classes and we'd have to turn away turn them away every week people would get there an hour early to be it just took off and I thought with all my kind of um you know shiny colorful glittery um workout clothes I thought I'm very much a kind of you know niche person mm-hmm. turned out it was huge and so that was I don't know that would have been 92 90 literally years and years and years ago. And so I was taught, and as my career built up, I kept teaching, I reduced it, and then I had to take breaks to make plays or films. But I basically kept that going for many years. And then I really did stop. And then people just petitioned me, please, will you just teach one class a week? So every Sunday, I teach an exercise class. Um, and, and I've done that right through the pandemic, every Sunday by Zoom. Zoom. And um, every single Sunday, and um, including through Christmas and every Wednesday. Oh. Um, so, but Wednesdays, I think, will stop soon because, <laughs> you know, it takes a lot, a lot of time. But I really love teaching it. And I have these amazing people, some of whom are little kids when they come with their mother to my oh. class. And now they're grown up with kids of their own. I've been doing it forever and ever and ever. But fitness is just a big thing. I, every, every rehearsal of mine, the poor cast has to go through a sweaty warm up. And so it's just a big part of what I believe in. One of my films is called Fit. Mm -hmm. And uh, (laughs) I'm I'm a big passionate, it gives me energy because people often say, well, how'd you get the energy to do so many projects? And the answer to that is um, by staying fit. Yeah. By staying fit. And so, you know, when I've done stuff at the National Youth Theatre, which has been some of the joys of my life to be there, and I've done summer courses, they all have to do sweaty warm ups every morning with me. It's good. It's good to get yourself pumped in the morning as well, anyway, but let alone just before a rehearsal. Yeah. Do you exercise? You look I incredibly do. fit. I'm an exerciser. I am. I, yes. <laughs> during the first lockdown, I did. I, it was more of like <laughs> not exercising, more of like existential dread. But uh, come you on, know. two and three. I got myself back in. Yeah, everyone had different rhythms. Some people exercised a lot at the end, at the beginning, and then just couldn't do it in the winter. They were just like, I, 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 I. you know, my, <laughs> my 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 inner spirit has just collapsed and needs to lie down on a chaise lounge for a month or two. Everyone's been different. I, of course, am like uh, 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 obsessive, so I've just done exercise all the time, all the way through, and particularly these classes, which it's so good because people are stuck in their houses, and you can just. Mm bring sunshine into their houses so I take in the in when the weather's good I take the the laptop out to the park I take it to different sites to the riverside 
um, yeah, I, you know, to the seaside. I've that made them come with me to different workouts in different weather systems, I need in different to locations. Talking. So they don't know what they're going to see when I turn on the, <laughs> the camera. <laughs> And sometimes it's in my that. house, you know. Um, do you ever rest? It sounds like you haven't been rested since you were seven. <laughs> um, you know, I think of myself as really lazy, but once I said that in public, my boyfriend at the time looked at me and went, lazy? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I think you see me, you know I'm lazy. And he's like, I don't know what your version of lazy is. <laughs> so I think of myself as very lazy and I think that I do give myself time. Um, I do give my a lot of time to other people and I've learned that I have to limit that somewhat because it's so part of who I am. It's never going to go away. It's very important to me to carry the legacy of what Lois and the people at my at the Bermondsey Free School taught me, which is that everybody matters, that everybody needs to be seen and needs to be heard. And so my whole life revolves around how do I amplify more voices through my writing, through my directing, through who I choose, through who I mentor, through who I publish. You know, how do we get, how do we make this a more equitable world where we can all benefit from the resources? Because like we're ignoring, it's like we're, I see people as wells that people are walking past, walking by on, and not seeing and saying there's no water here. And yet there's a well right there. Yeah. And, uh, right there and just because it's a woman you don't see it just because it's a, 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 you know just because you don't agree with this person's politics or you think this person's too too privileged or you think this person's too common or too black or you don't see it too gay oh, that's nothing for me there I'm straight and there's nothing for me in the gay well well there is and so that's really important so that ke it keeps me going but I do have to go because some people don't understand when they're not used to getting people's time, they then sometimes don't respect other people's time. Right. So I'll get people writing me these big letters about, I've heard you give time. And then I turn up to meet them and they're an hour and a half late and it's everyone else's fault. And you know, yeah. So I've learned to just kind of, <laughs> just kind of I be a bit balance. disciplined and, and, you know, t turn off the phone, turn off, you know, certain moments, be with my friends or be with my, you know, my significant other or be with myself. All of that is as important as being with other people. That self-care is, is universal care because, if, you know, if you become a, a kind of diseased cell, mm -hmm. um, then you infect other cells. You become one of those negative people that is making other people's lives bad. So it's good balance. But I do have a very, very, very high energy level. Yeah, I can't yeah. deny that, and so I, I'm, I, I don't want to pretend that I'm, you know, but I don't expect other people to be the same. No, we're See, all that's different. Weird. I'm very like, I'm very much like you. I have a lot of energy. I work myself to the bone. Yeah, I definitely can suffer from toxic productivity a lot, where I'm kind of like, oh, I could rest right now, or I could do another project. Um, <laughs> but yeah, also, you do have to replenish. You do have to get downhill a bit so that you know again your will your well can fill up you know right and Very I think important. sometimes I, I used to get into um a habit of sort of almost expecting other people around me to meet me here and meet me at my standard and getting really frustrated if people weren't doing as much as right. me or weren't putting as much effort into things as me but and I've got that to become point, painful yeah yeah and I've got to a point now I'm just like different people work in different ways and you know yeah. just because it's my way doesn't mean it's the right way <laughs> right and also choose the people who who are who are good at that the level you want to go at if you want to run a marathon you can't go well I'm sorry I've, I've taken people along with me who can't run marathons but I've got to, we have to accommodate them they mm -hmm. should not be running a marathon and they should be doing another thing with you yeah. sometimes you have to make those hard choices and go you know, because they will tell you they can run a marathon and then they'll st stand there eating a burger going, I'll, I'll start in a minute. And yeah. you have to go, baby, this marathon's ain't for you. Let's try yeah. the shop up for you. Let's try, let's try eating for you. Let's try the eating because you're a champion eater, but you ain't a champion runner. Yeah. You know, there's, there's some of that. It's, that, again, is how my school works. You know, instead of going, why don't you know your maths? Why don't you? They were like, what do you, what? you know what do you like oh you like car engines well this is how maths attaches to a car engine if you want to run a garage you are going to need to know how to how to to uh, balance your books or they're going someone's going to come over and and swindle you and then they want to learn it right so it's about meeting people at their levels it's so you're so absolutely right you've got to understand people's energy levels and go 
this is the right thing for you, even though they may be banging on another door in your house going, I belong in this room. You go, ah, no, 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 no. No. <laughs> your room. <laughs> it's so like refreshing to hear how your school works. It's actually, I used to, before I came to drama school, I used to work at um, a nursery and that's how it works with nurseries with, children, with uh, very small children. You find out their passion and you sort of teach them from there. Yeah. I've always been like, this is what school should have been like. So I remember being yes. in secondary school and being like, I don't need to learn this. I'm going to be famous one day. And my teacher being like, well, you, you do need maths if you're famous. Because what about like when you've got to pay for stuff? And I was like, I'm going to have someone who does that for me. Mm. And that person <laughs> goes steal from you. So yeah, you that's exactly what my teacher out. said. <laughs> <laughs> you need to be on it. You need to be on it. But that yeah that's good teaching like okay that's not your primary thing but it's a fundamental thing and this is how it applies to you because people are very self-centered in a in a healthy way in many in many cases which is you know if it doesn't if I don't see how it relates to me I don't want to watch it I don't want to read it I don't want to know about it I don't want to give charity give my money to it and when they see how it benefits them they want it everyone Mm -hmm. wants mobile phones because they see how it benefits them and and um and people who don't think it benefits them don't want it it's as simple as that so it's about waking up to what we need and what we want and and not and not being and being having a broad vision isn't it of like yeah. well if i want to do this much in a day i should exercise in the morning is how i see it yeah absolutely but like on that with regards to like people only really being interested in things that they think are for them yeah. as a black queer writer and performer I've found yeah. in the last couple of years, like doing shows, uh, I did a showcase with National Youth Theatre called Rush, which was a showcase of some of Britain's best young black talent. Um, I invite everyone from school. And it was like, of only my best friends and my black friends felt like they need, felt like it was for them. And same with when I do queer stuff, it's like, I feel like only my queer friends feel like it's for them. And I'm, I'm just still at that point where I'm trying to figure out a way to make my lived experiences universal because, as much as I love right, have I love having queer black stories for people who are in both those demographics. How do you cross that bridge and bring other people in to learn about our lifestyle? Um, you have to. You just have to be so fierce they want to. The, you know, the secret has already been by the people who have the biggest platforms. I've told you how to do it. Um, you know, so there's this kind of assault on the kind of white middle class uh, male. Uh, you know, heterosexual perspective. And, you know, one of the reasons that there's an assault on it, you know, it's a gentle assault, but it's there of like, is this relevant? We've seen you enough. But, you know, they are there to be learned from. They uh, did a great job of getting their stories out there and convincing people that you need to watch this handsome heterosexual hero rescue, you know, the world and kill all the fuzzy wuzzies. And do you know what I mean? You literally, they made us, watch it even though sometimes it was painful and and in almost a, an insult insult <laughs> they but you know it, you look at that women will go and see you know have been going to see movies where it's all male led and it's actually the treatment of women in the movie is often quite bad mm-hmm. but they'll go because they've convinced us that that's the universal experience and the rest of us have to fit in and they've done that by quite frankly often doing it very very well you know a movie like die hard I, i've never seen die hard but it's very popular you know, these movies with, you know, with, they, with these leads have been have been huge and they've marketed them well and they've given people the visceral or romantic or whatever thrills. And then other people from outside that demographic just go, well, that's, you know, America has convinced us it's the center of the world and everyone wants to be an American on some level, right? Yeah. So the thing there is, rather than spending our energy telling them off for being successful, I think our energy is like, okay, how do we do it our way? Not copy it, but how do we go, how do we have that, like, that, that a healthy level of that, sen- of that sense of entitlement and self-confidence to go, my story is my story and I don't have to water it down. I just tell my story really, really well and people will come to me. A, a, a good example of that is um, RuPaul's Drag Race which has, this, has started off on, on, on Logo, which is a gay identified channel on, um, you know, in America. And it just, the show was so irresistibly entertaining. Yeah. I mean, I've only just recently watched it. I'm a big RuPaul fan, but for me, it was, to me, it was a bit too commercial and a bit too like, you know, mainstream drag queeny for me. 
at first, but I, my friend made me watch a, a season recently and a binge, and I really enjoyed it. And, you know, he, they, they had this huge, they just did it so strongly, it was so what it was. They didn't, they didn't pull back on the slang. They didn't pull back on the attitude. They just let you have it. And then I, I see straight kids all over the place going, oh, I love RuPaul's Drag Race. They love watching it because it's entertaining and fun. And, um, and so I feel like you, you, it's not about you crossing over. It's about you, uh, them crossing over to you. It's about you having such a good time at your party that the neighbours, instead of banging on the wall and saying, turn the music down, go, my God, the tune's in there. Um, do you mind if we come around? We've got a bottle. Can we, you know, why have you invited us to your party? That's where you want to be. You want to turn up your light so bright and have such a welcoming, beautiful place that people go, how do I get in? And uh, you know what I mean? Rather than pandering and then constantly acknowledging their power over you by going, how do I win you over? I think you win yourself over and you're just fierce. And, and, and that's something that, something that, again, it's, it's hard one fight, but it's something that black people have had to do. You know, th there was a lot of, okay, we'll do the white version of this music and then we'll make more money. Um, and, you know, and then, they, but then you just got so fierce when, so when you're, you know, your Motown was my perfect example. The music was so poppy and so fun and so um, irresistible, such strong earworms. And Berry Gordy found the Temptations, the Four Tops, the Jackson Five, Dinah Ross and the Supremes, Marvin Gaye, Smokey Robinson and the Miracles, Martha Reeves and the Vandellas. All these people were huge artists, all in one tiny building. And the world was like, how do we get some of this? How do we? So then the Beatles come over and, um, and they're like, we just want to meet all these. We want to meet all the Motown people. We want to meet Little Richard. We want to meet Chuck Berry. Everyone's like, you don't want to meet Frank Sinatra? And they're like, no, we want to meet the... And so you just turn it up so to, to 11 <laughs> and uh, you know what I mean? And you just make something that's so irresistible. Everyone starts talking about it. And you Shakira are the perfect person to do that. You know, it's not about chasing them. It's about chasing yourself and just making something that you find irresistible, that you find deep and soulful and entertaining, putting it out there. And, and if you build it, as the movie says, they will come. Yeah. You know, it, it's that self-confidence that we can learn from the kind of Winston Churchills of this world, you know, <laughs> um, where he, despite his shortcomings, has ma managed to make himself into such a national hi hi hero that people defend everything he's done, good and bad, right? Yeah. You can do this. We can argue whether he deserves that or not, or we can get on with doing our, our own version of the same thing. Yeah. No, that, that that analogy, the the party next door, wanting to come in rather than complain analogy. That's such a yeah. Such a just metaphor. have such a great party that your party is a legendary, and people will start. Then the business will only come from why am I not invited, and then you're winning. Yeah, absolutely. You're never going to get everyone to love what you do. Shakespeare. If I go down on the street today, in almost any city, any major city in the world, and say who's the greatest playwright in the English language, they will say Shakespeare. And then if I and I say why, and they'll go, he's just the best. He's the number one. And I go, do you want to come and see a Shakespeare play now? They'll be, oh, no, I'm busy. <laughs> so it, you know, be, people are scared of Shakespeare. Um, of course, it's our job to make them less scared of it. But the um, but they still acknowledge it's number one. But even Shakespeare cannot get, you know, there are people who just would rather die than see a yeah. Shakespeare play right now, right? If someone like Prince, there are people who just think, I don't get it. And how could you not get Prince? But they don't get it. No. Beyonce's, you know, killing it. Everyone can see that. There are people like, I think she's false. I don't like her. She's not my thing. She's not a great singer. I don't think she's a great dancer. I mean, what more you, you know, if no one hates you, you don't know enough people. You're not fierce enough. But, you know what I mean? So you, so don't try and get everyone to love you. Just try and get the people who need you to accept to 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 um, to access you. Yeah. That's all you need. That's enough. Yeah. That's what. Sh there's no one who's universally loved. Even you know Jesus was crucified. Nobody is. Nobody is. <laughs> is you know, with everyone. 
I needed that pep talk this Friday morning. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, so we spoke a bit about your writing and where that came from, and, and you're doing your your plays on the on the estate stairs, which I just oh, the images I have in my head are just amazing. Um, how did you go from doing writing like your own books and your own plays into getting yourself into TV and film? I turned up my light really bright. I kept putting on stuff. It felt like it took me a very long time because I started young. But when I was about 28, 29, was when I had the first breakthrough. I just I kept putting on my own plays, which I always spent my own money on. Yeah. And, um, and I got my friends to be in them. And I was doing that whilst, you know, getting my equity card and being a dancer and being a singer and being in other people's stuff and just kind of I was this kind of people everyone knew about me but I wasn't mainstream at all I was you know but people knew about me and then I did a one person show it was one of those times you think oh, okay dragging all the kids to school every day is a bit much I'm gonna just do a play where it's just me yeah. just for and and uh, and I did a one person play and it was about that I decided to do it about this uh, boy from the South in America who goes as Dinah Ross to his high school prom. It turns into a big fight and he leaves and goes to um, New York and he gets involved in the Stonewall riots, which were the gay riots in 1969 that launched gay liberation, the kind of final big riots of the 60s after uh, our civil rights riots, the feminist, feminist marches, et cetera, et cetera anti-Vietnam anti marches, then finally there were the gay marches in 96, at the end of that decade. And so he gets involved in that and that got, and I got my best friend who I met in youth theatre, I was in the old Vic Youth Theatre, because yeah. you know, South London, and um, my bestie from there, who we stayed, we're still best friends, we're brothers to this day, um, who I met when I was 15, he directed me um, in this one person play and somebody I'd known from, you know, being around and doing classes was working with Payne's Payne's Plow. Mm. And um and they 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 didn't, you know, commission me, but they gave me space and helped with that. And 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 I just did this one person show and my friend who directed it had had done well in his career and he was like he'd become an opera director and he invited someone from the BBC um who he was working with to um, on on, an, on a TV opera to come and see his work, and the guy was also working on this project called Stonewall, which was about the riots. And he came up to me and said afterwards, "Oh, that was great. Uh, you you know a lot about the Stonewall riots." And I was like, "Yeah," thinking I don't know that much, but yes, is obviously the answer in this situation. He said, "Do you want to have a meeting with me on Monday?" He said, "Yeah." I said, "Yeah." I ran out and bought this book about Stonewall that he said he was going to be adapting into this movie. And I hustled and got the job as the screenwriter for the movie of Stonewall. And so it was all like friends and friends and friends. My a friend was just like me. He came up on a council estate on the Old Kent Road. We had no connections. He was an amazing networker though. And, um, and so what I learned from there is you, A, you've got to turn your party up. By then I was teaching exercise classes. Okay. So, so I invited all the people in my exercise classes to see my shows because they were an audience that loved me so they were going to come and see some of my shows so I was always always thinking of ways to to create theatre events and experiences out of whatever was around which was in this case this wonderful audience of of, of uh, it was all elaborate groves all these West London women and men but mostly women and they would come and see my stuff and a lot of them were to do with the BBC and because it's West London so people just start talking about you and it all starts to connect up because you're doing stuff I've always done a lot and then it all came together and I got this Stonewall movie. And that Stonewall, um, I immediately got fired a week later because the, then they, the BBC suddenly bought and went, well, he's not from New York, it's set in New York, we should get an American writer. And they tried all these top writers like Larry Kramer and all these people. But I, a, a year later, the job came back to me because I'd always had the strongest take on this idea. And then we made this movie called Stonewall, which then, I was, so I was meant to be in, but they decided not to cast me because the director thought I would upstage him by being the writer and the star of the film. <laughs> I had to suck that up. And then I went along to the, they didn't invite me to any film festivals when the film came out because writers are not considered very important once the film is made. Yeah. 
yeah. I decided to go to the Venice Film Festival and and be at my be at the screening. And I went there with a friend, went onto the red carpet just without being invited. <laughs> yeah, I went there, and I was there, so the audience asked me questions about the film. I toured in Italy as a dancer, so I had some pigeon Italian, and I answered using all my Italian words in this huge venue in ben Venice. And that really was that getting that movie, and then that moment where I flew to Venice and decided to crash my uh, my own premiere. <laughs> That was the moment because everyone saw me and all every I was the only black person there basically at the festival. So mm -hmm. I just stood out everywhere I walked. So they were interviewing me. And that meant I was then became the face of that movie. And I toured all around the world. I went to Chicago, went to Los Angeles, went to New York, um, which was an incredible premiere. I went, you know, and I and because I was a good talker, they started letting me host the event. So in New York, I hosted the whole event and I introduced the cast to all these amazing New York based actors that you see in movies, in, in shows like, um, in things like Ghost and, um, and the, the Sopranos, you know, so it, I, and I, I really got around and then people were chatting to me and going, you should come to LA and uh, oh, well, I'll be there for a premiere. I'd go there and I just w took meetings and that is how I got an American career. And also that bolstered my British career because writers are, um, really treated very badly, which is why I'm very passionate about developing writers. Mm. And, um, but I learned then, you've just got to turn your light up bright and you've got to get out there. I'm very shy, you wouldn't believe that. I'm very, very shy. So that was a big, big hurdle for me to, to overcome. Um, and, and, but it still is, but now I, you know, shyness doesn't help me promote my work or promote the people I want to support. So I leave my shyness at home whenever I'm working. Yeah. And so that is how I got really, really going in the mainstream. And, um, and Stonewall wasn't a huge hit commercially, but it, it was an impactful film. And, um, and it meant that I, um, it's been remade in a, couple, a few years later with a lot of compromises and not very, and I sadly was a big failure. But our original 1995 version has broken down a lot of walls. It basically, if you look at something like Pose, clearly that it, you know it influenced pose and so many different which i love um we influenced a lot of um queer films uh, subsequently Amazing. and so again i'm trying to con i'm sorry i'm sorry my answer is so long but i'm trying to condense you know a, a a very long career into to things that people can digest but that again is why i often teach workshops about networking about career about career management because I think people don't know these things and they sit at home thinking, why is the world not knocking on my door? Why is this not coming to me? Why are not people not seeing me or hearing me? And the thing they have to know is you, to be heard, you must hear, to be seen, you must see, and you have to go after what you want and you have to realize you're a service provider and go to the audience and let them know that you're here to serve them. Yeah, brilliant. And on, on workshops, <clears throat> perfect way to segue into the workshops that you were doing over the pandemic last year mm -hmm. uh, with regards to the three monologue books so let's chat about yes those. i am so excited about those that has been an exercise in deep patience because <laughs> right at the beginning of the monologue i was doing a, a queer youth theater which included allies just before the pandemic we were just getting to do that and I, you know, I've been wanting to do this piece that originally got was developed at NYT, which is um, called Timeless, which is all about, you know, you know, LGBTQ plus um, uh, stories and and people throughout the ages, throughout all time, and uh, and around the world. And so we're working on that. And then I was doing that with the, I started this youth, this queer youth group, which quite a few people in like forty. And, um, and and it was writers and and there was like two groups, writers and actors. We were getting going, and then the pandemic hit. Boom, end of the whole thing, right? It just all ended. And so I decided, well, why don't we do books? Because um, they can do that from home. So I did lots of workshops about all different things: acting, writing, directing, all kinds of things on Zoom, just to keep people connected, and you know. 
And it meant people could come to workshops who lived in Brazil and lived in Canada and lived in Spain. And people go, oh, I've wanted to do a workshop with you forever. And now I can be here, you know. So people are up at three in the morning in their time zone doing the workshop, amazing. <laughs> and so I decided to do these three books. One is called um, Lit. Um, and that is a book of audition pieces for people from um, underrepresented minorities. One is called um, Fierce, which is people from the LGBTQ um, diaspora um, and speeches um, for actors who want to find something that fits that. And one is called Common, which is working class voices. And, um, and so we did these huge workshops where, and we um, and 70 odd writers in each book have created monologues that are for audition, uh, for, you know, audition worthy. And, um, and the, my job, I spent the whole summer, it was, it was a lot. I spent the whole summer feeding back with some writers, you know, it was first draft, bang. Um, but most of course needed to go back and forth and learn how to do a speech, learn how to structure it. Um, and we, it, it was an incredible summer of that, but it overwhelming, you know, cause it's like oh, 200 God. writers or 250 writers. And, and so constantly what's happening with them and reading their scripts. And so by the end of the summer, we'd got all this, they, we'd got everything except for a couple who dropped out themselves. We didn't abandon anybody. Uh, mm. I just, we, I, some people worked for four months to get their script right or more. And now we're, they're all put together in books and they're ready to be launched. We, we put them all together. John and I, John runs the book company of Team Angelica Books, Team Angelica Publishing. And, uh, and he, and we've gone through them all, um, put, cur cur curated them all and done all the contracts. It's all ready, we've got the books ready, but we, everyone's like, when are the books gonna launch? But we don't wanna launch them until we can do a party launch for each book because it's so important, writers have their WhatsApp groups and it's so important for them to meet each other and to correspond, rather than just send them a book in the mail and done, and no one yeah. really sees it. We've got to really launch it, have this great networking event so they can meet each other, so that some of them can perform their monologues because a lot of them are actors, as you know, and uh, they, right? And, um, <laughs> I'm and smiling because I'm like, that means I get three parties, I can't wait. Yeah, because you're in all three books, right? <laughs> and, um, and that's so cool, right? And, and, and to show that intersectionalism, I really wanted queer voices in the working class book. I wanted working class voices in the queer book. I wanted working class voices in the black book. I wanted black voices in the queer book. In the, you know, I wanted to, to constantly, rather than, oh, you know, working class to everyone seems to mean white. And that's not what I wanted to no, do. Right. So obviously they're a big part of it, right? It's Britain. It's just so beautiful. And, um, and so I'm, I'm desperate to launch the book, but you know what's happening. Can you get, you know, th that's 70 writers in the room, plus their guests, plus yeah. industry. Mm -hmm. We need to be, uh, to be able to have a theater that's allowed to have 200 people in it. Cause the Bush wants to launch it. Mm. But you know, I, we can't do it when it's distancing and stuff. We need people yeah. to be able to hug. We need to be able to pack the place. So it's, it's driving me crazy because we have to wait and wait and wait and wait, but we have to wait yeah. because I, I don't want the party to be half assed and oh, that kind of happened. I want everybody to be there and really celebrated, have several artists on stage doing the speeches, have a vibe, have music, just like roadblock party, block party, yes. you know, realness. So it's coming though, but we have to wait and see how this, this, how this theater opening works. Yes. And we have to wait and see if there's gonna be, I think I think there may be a third and final wave. Yeah. And and what that, it may not be, I'm with, you know, but I don't wanna risk my writers being broken hearted. No, exactly. We don't wanna get our hopes up and get excited. No, and I don't wanna do it on Zoom. I, you know, I love my I'm Zoom. Not on Zoom. No. Not this, they've got to meet, they've all, worked, they all met on Zoom already. They've got to be in the room with each other and big each other up. It's so important because we can create a generation of great writers in these areas who are also, in many cases, great performers. Yeah. And you know, and there are some people who've really got a few credits and they're up there and it's just as important for them to, to be with somebody who's like, oh my God, how am I here? I've never written anything before this in my life altogether.
And it's so, such a it's such a lovely networking experience. Like you say, we've got the WhatsApp groups and um like I've already made loads of friends and networks from just from being on these Zooms. Like you said, there's yeah. loads of people for the audience, just for context, you're on a Zoom and you've got to click the button to go across like four times to see all the amount of people. So there's no way you yeah. can take in everyone. And then I did an R and D session recently and one of the girls who was in the R and D session, she's in the common book and like yes. Another thing with someone who was in the lit book. So it's like, yeah, we're all getting together. Yes, that is what is, uh, that is the, that's what this is for. That is what this is for. So it's worth waiting a little bit. Yeah. But like, ah, <laughs> it's been a consuming project for me. I'm super, super proud of it. Oh, I, I can't wait to see them. I can't wait to read everybody else's. Oh. They're really good. I, you know, you know me, I was harsh. Yeah. <laughs> I was yeah. like, here are your notes, here are your notes. People were like, no. I was like, listen, let's talk this through. I was on the phone to people. I was reading <laughs> aloud with people. I didn't play. I, Because I, it I wasn't enough that it'd be a book. It has to be a good book. Mm -hmm. They have to be great speeches. And you know, you're a great writer, but you know, it's, but to write three great speeches, it's not as easy as it sounds. One that stands alone, you know, and that someone can be- one of the books I've like one of the monologues I remember doing I think it was the it must have been the fierce one because it was the first one workshop I did with you and I just came away from that so inspired I remember writing it that night and sending it to you oh yeah and you did like you've just written this I'm like yeah I just it came out my head and then like I remember getting to one of the other ones and just being like I don't know what to write it was so like it was it was really interesting yeah, I think you were the first one I think you literally sent something that night in the middle yeah. of the night I was so keen. <laughs> yeah, I loved it. I loved it. And of course, I responded to it. Mm. Yeah. Oh, it's just, yes. And the thing I had to say to people is, have you read it out loud? Mm. And if you were going to audition um, and you were looking for a speech, would you choose this speech? Would this be the one? Would you choose this over all the other speeches that are out there in the world? And if they were like, no, I wouldn't. I was like, then you have to rewrite it. Right, yeah. The, the job of this speech is somebody goes, oh my God, this is a treasure. This is gonna make my, this is gonna change my life. I'm gonna get into National Youth Theatre. I'm gonna get into drama school. I'm gonna get this audition. I'm gonna smash this. I'm gonna be able to spotlight myself and do a little video for, um, for Twitter or YouTube and just showcase myself. If it's okay, no one's gonna use it. It's gotta be great. And that was a big jump for people in their minds. Like, oh, it's not got to just be written. It's actually got to be boss. It's got to be, it's got to be a life changer for somebody. And a lot of people, that was a big, I could see the light bulb go off and people, oh, <laughs> you know, when you read it, do you feel like I'm going to get this job? Mm. If you're not feeling that, write me another speech. And yeah. I really feel like we've got three books because John is very harsh critic you know, who's editing the books with me. And he was like, oh, this this one's really good. Oh, this is really, uh, you know, cause he would tell me, oh, what's this? This is dull, this is pedestrian. <laughs> and uh, and he was just like, wow, wow, wow. That's what I want. So when we launch it and we uh, hopefully make some videos of them and stuff, yeah. we, a bomb is going off. A love bomb is going off in the industry. I'm so excited. It's going to be a complete cultural shift. I can't wait. <laughs> um, so, yeah, let's talk about what you're up to at the minute. You're directing a couple of shows at the minute. Are you allowed? Yeah, I've just been directing a lot of drama school shows, which has yeah. been fascinating, um, and writing them for the students, which, again, is very humbling and, and a beautiful thing to do and what I love doing. Um, and now I've kind of come through a big period of intense work on that. It has been very difficult with COVID restrictions, started on Zoom, getting into the room, constantly testing, all of that, but wonderful fun as well. And so life affirming. And, um, and then they have to do the performances and we make digital theatre because there's no audiences, because we were just before the audience yeah. growth, which is happening now. And um, so coming out of that, which literally finished yesterday, I've now got a bunch of R&Ds working with emerging writers, which is great. I've been given a few of those and I'm very excited to do them. And I'm taking time um, and I'm also doing it's summer. So I host a lot of Vogue balls, Voguing balls, Manchester, Liverpool. I'm going to Huddersfield with one. 
um, Birmingham. So there's going to be a lot of those over the summer and Black Pride, which I get to host every year, a big section of. So kind of performance. So I've been trying to get really fit so I can squeeze into my costumes <laughs> and, uh, and just be fun and just have that energy to keep it the crowd going, going wild. So there's that coming, but also I'm trying to make, I've, I've made a lot of space in, um, in this summer to work on screenplays of things I want to get made and want to do and, you know, working with my American career as well. So, cause I've been giving a lot of time over, over lockdown to other people's work. Yeah. And I've developed several plays with people, all of which are starting to emerge into the world with amazing writers, like five, I think I've done over the last few months. Um, so that, and that's a big commitment because you're yeah. working with them over, I, we read it through every line and I question every line, they go back and rewrite it and they're tearing their hair out. So all these things are coming to fruition, but I've made, back to the beginning of our conversation, space in my life to do the things I want to do. And also to practice my songwriting, because I'm a songwriter and I want to write a musical. Mm -hmm. And so that takes up a lot of space. So my summer is, um, is short bursts of things with these R&Ds and these performances with a lot of um, personal career growth in, in the middle of that. We're really wanting to, writing those scripts and those um uh and that and that musical that I've wanted to do for a very long time so it's a very busy summer um but um it, it feels like a, a a life changer it feels like I'm shifting different things and um and accessing different things that I have wanted to express for a long time that's so exciting what type of musical are you wanting to write uh, you know, I like writing musicals that are sung through, so they're like pop operas, yeah. and um, and that's what uh, there's a, there's a one that I made as a film years ago that didn't get finished because there was some big big problem with the the production. So we shot it, and then the film never came out. And um, and but I've always thought I think that should have been an opera, and I started writing these songs and and previewed little bits of it over the last few years and it really set it was like oh I really love this so um but it, you know so it's, it's a lot of time on your own you know this is, I've got my studio in my flat you can see hence this kind of microphone and stuff you know and I've got my headphones and and you can see the guitars and stuff and and I've got my keyboards so I've I've that's very, you have to be like locked in the house for like 12 hours, just being, you know, totally lost in it and imagining your Stevie Wonder, another Motown <laughs> discovery. And, uh, and just like playing all your instruments and stuff. And that takes some time. So I'm trying to section up my summer. So this screenplay can be written here. This idea can be pitched to people here. And um, then there's this time of being in my cocoon and imagining that I'm, you know, that, that that I'm Bon Iver or George Michael, the song singer, songwriter, <laughs> and just trying to dig deep. I really want to dig deeper. Yeah. And um and make some really soulful statements. Cause you know, it's my big but I'm 60 this summer. So I so it's sorry? When's your birthday? July 25th. And I will be hosting a big voguing ball in Manchester on my birthday. Oh. Open oh. air. I'm coming. It'll be amazing. <laughs> o open air event um, at home theatre for you know in, in with the contact theatre and I'm super excited about that. But the um, but you know we get to that that uh, you know I don't feel what I imagined sixty was going to be like. I feel like a six year old. I feel like I'm just getting started. Yeah. But you know you have to say to yourself at that point, okay. So you know, uh, maybe you maybe if you keep looking after yourself, you've got forty years, right? What do you really want to do with those years? What statements do you want to make? What you know? What 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 is it you've 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 been delaying? What have you not been saying? What have you not been looking at? What have you not been fulfilling? And you can't keep delaying it. You you know, I'm lucky I can still go up on the stage and do the splits and everything at, at my age. And so how many years of that is there left? Get up there and do it, you know, bring out your inner Beyonce. Yes, at all times, bring out your inner Beyonce. Absolutely. 
<laughs> um, so what we do to wrap up the mm. podcast is we grab some advice from each guest for any okay. listeners, uh, who are new to the business, who are already like established in the business, who might want to write, direct, yeah, everything that you do, make musicals. Um, what advice would you give to these people who are listening? Ooh, well, here are the things I've learned that everything that you have been told will hold you back is what will take you forward. So take what's strange, what's unusual, what's scary, what's often criticized about you. As long as it's not your cruelty or your meanness or your laziness, you know, if it's, it, but if, if people are like, oh, you know, you're strange looking or you've got this weird idea of, you know, that's your gold right there. That's the, that's the stuff, that's the stuff. And you, that's what will take you forward. So really bear down on what makes you unusual, make, what makes you weird, what makes you, um, un, what unnerves people about you and turn that into something, what, into what it is, beautiful, something beautiful. Because nature is, evolution is, is is the power of the strange the you know the the humanoid with the opposable thumbs the others were like oh freak they're the ones <laughs> that could get the apple off the tree so and they're the ones that that took us forward you know think of yourself as a mutation not as an aberration so bear down on who you are your working classness your your gayness your straightness your poshness whatever it is it's it's there to help you and don't it, it, you, you know understand if, if you have privilege which everybody does in some area at some time understand that you should use that wisely but do not see it as a reason to step back or to to dim your light somebody needs you and you must take that forward um believe in yourself and you have to do the work you have doing the work means learning how to rest learning how to have boundaries learning how to replenish but that's all all work everything's work love is work rest is work work is work and you and and you have to do that and you have to kind of do that steadily so rather than knock yourself out and then have to lie down for a year you can work steadily and then have to lie down for a week because that's that's who you are and um and don't um, and also don't be afraid to be bad. You have to be bad to get better. Babies don't apologize for falling over. They just get up and they start to walk. Even as everybody stands around laughing and taking photos and going, how cute. The baby doesn't go, why is everyone looking at me? Stop looking at me. The baby just walks. And then, and if they can't walk, if they don't have legs, they find a way to get around. Mm -hmm. And we, we've seen it. And um, if they have no arms and legs, the baby will wriggle. They are unafraid, unashamed. Um, uninhibited and determined to have a life and then that gets beaten out of us don't let it get beaten out of you don't worry about envying anyone else it's poisonous don't worry about anyone envying you that's also poisonous you don't have to try and be better than anyone else only yourself you only have to be better than yourself and you have to start off by thinking I'm fabulous already, I'm just going to be a better fabulous. I'm going to be a more refined fabulous. I'm going to be a more focused fabulous. And that takes a while because we've been taught to dislike ourselves. And, uh, and, 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 and that's almost everybody. And I, I'm actually very inspired by Prince Harry at the moment. Um, I never thought I'd ever say that. <laughs> I, I love that he is just kind of going, people are slagging him off all the time, but he's just like, I'm going to do this my way. I am going to do this my way and I'm going to be honest about about all of it and I think that's incredibly inspiring and um and he will make mistakes but the fact is he is the thing that you can see he's doing is how do I have a better life how do I have a better life I don't have to have the life that comes with my title I can have the life I want and that is something every one of us can learn from you do not have to have the life that your title dispose um um, bestows upon you you can have the life you want and and that in that title can be discarded or included in that but you are the one who's making that decision and no one else no one else is making not your mother not your the person you're in love with not the fans not the critics not your mentors all those people are important but in the end only if the only voice that matters the only glass ceiling that you can hold you back the only wall that can that can uh, that can 
close your door and make it impossible to get through is yours. The rest, are, it's, it's their shit. It's their stuff. That's theirs. That's not yours. People's criticisms are not you. They're, that's their autobiography. Absolutely. Well, fantastic way to wrap up the episode. Um, we wanted to make sure that the podcast was as accessible as possible. So if yep. you or someone that you know it may be hard of hearing and want to see the closed caption version um, of this video, of this podcast, sorry, um, or if you just want to see mine and Rick's not a video, what did I wear this for? <laughs> <laughs> then just log on to youtube <laughs> the national youth theaters youtube um and you can watch the episode there with the closed captions um thank you so much for joining us today ricky thank you everybody for listening we hope you enjoyed thanks for being amazing yeah.